Hi, everyone. Welcome to Community Conversations. My name is Courtney Shaw. I'm the facilitator of our series, and thank you all for joining us again. Uh, we hope to have a nice, smooth, well-interneted presentation today with our two speakers, uh, as well as we are recording so that if you want to catch this later or send the link to a friend who wasn't able to come today, we are very happy to have those all up on our website, as well as they go on the LCC YouTube channel. So I want to give a shout out to the, uh, the LCC website and YouTube um, uh, PR folk who are helping me out tremendously this quarter with, uh, with all of the backup stuff. Also, next week will be our last Community Conversations presentation for the series. We are done after that one. There is no presentation on Thanksgiving. And then we go into you know the, the end of the quarter and finals and everything, so we don't have any after that. So next week will be our last one, but we will be back on January 14th with our winter series on communications. So keep an eye on the website. That will have information about our dates and speakers and topics as those get solidified. We don't have all that information yet, but I'm working on it. I will get there. Okay, uh, next week is Michael Strayer. And if you've never heard Michael speak, you're gonna want to. So make sure to come out to that one. He's gonna be speaking on uh, the transgenerational problems of slavery and how that has worked through uh, families and generations and the psychology of that. So I, something I don't know a whole lot about, I'm looking forward to learning about it. And I hope you all are as well. But this week, we're going to be talking about donkeys, and I'm very excited for this. <laughs> we have two speakers this week. We have Michael Ann Watts. Uh, Michael Ann has been an instructor at LCC for 15 years, teaching in transitional studies, and she has many passions, family, teaching, learning, animals, and sustainable farming. And for the past two years, Michael Ann and her husband, Brian, have been rescuing donkeys for Peaceful Valley Donkey Rescue and adopting them out to forever homes in the Pacific Northwest. Katie Graham grew up on a farm in Castle Rock and now has a farm in Kelso where she raises miniature Hereford cattle and now miniature donkeys with her husband and two kids. She graduated from LCC in 2002 and loved her experience so much she wanted to come back to teach. She's been a history and math instructor in transitional studies for 11 years. So please welcome Michael Ann and Katie. Hi, Hi all. Katie and I grew up two miles from each other too. So we have a long history of being fast friends and farm girls together. So, and I never right. thought I would own a donkey, but this lady will talk you into just about anything. So <laughs> I have two and hence the reason I'm here. All right. So we're going to talk about the big idea of uh, donkeys today. And thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you guys giving up your afternoon and uh, all right, let's get started. So here's the big idea. What if we, you and I, could better the lives of donkeys worldwide? And you might be thinking, um, I didn't know donkeys needed a better life. So if you're thinking that, great. Uh, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna analyze your current perception of the donkey. So what is it that you already know? Um, maybe you know more than I do, which you can educate me, that'd be great. And then some misconceptions that you probably have that we can adjust. So that'll be something that I'm going to help you work on. And then we're going to evaluate the plight of donkeys, both here and abroad. And then we're going to identify ways that you can help. So I'm going to ask for just a little bit of audience participation here at the beginning. That's the only time, I promise. Um, so when I say donkey, what comes to mind? And if you want to unmute or you want to go in the comments, anything, just when I say the word donkey, what pops into your mind? I'm going to give you guys about 20 seconds. Go. Don't be shy. I'm going to take a moment and let people talk for a moment. Do it. This says, Sean has raised their hand. Yes. Okay. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Workhorse. Okay. I think Shrek. Yeah. What else? I know there's more people out here. Come on. When I say donkey, don't be shy. What do you think? Running through a fence. <laughs> okay. We have uh, in the chat, we have loud. Okay. Uh, a steam powered machine for yarding logs. Yep. Mascot. Hey. Mascot. Good. This is Nolan. 
when my grandparents retired, they traveled a lot and they loved to go to some place in Arizona with the little burrows that used to be in the mining. So that's what I think of. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. So um, here's kind of what society has perceived the donkey to be. So here's some famous ones. We have Eeyore, right? He was always kind of depressed. Woe is me. We have Shrek and his donkey and his donkey was loud and obnoxious and kind of out there. And then we have sort of some Disney perceptions where donkeys were not put in the best light. So when Pinocchio overindulged, he grew ears and turned into a donkey. When Tom um, from Tom and Jerry was not a good, he turned into a jackass. And then Bugs Bunny, when he was being stubborn, turned into the form of a donkey. So society has kind of given us this perception of a donkey as stubborn. I mean, you're stubborn as a donkey. They're lazy, they're mean, they're obnoxious, they're rude. So those are some things that people have often thought about with donkeys. Um, and I would like to encourage people to think of donkeys. And it was really great to hear you guys talk about that because you always brought up the positive, which was awesome. But donkeys have some really fantastic qualities. Uh, loyalty, stoicism, self-preserving that's often or interpreted as stubborn. Um, they're very adaptable. They are super gentle, loving, social, and smart. So these are just some ways that I want us to kind of view donkeys and I try and help people view donkeys so that we can change the narrative out there. Um, you can see some of the donkeys on the bottom right hand corner there just loving on kids, which is really neat to see. And then some of the athleticism of riding and pulling. So those are some great things for donkeys. All right, so let's just go over some basic facts really quick. So when I say some vocab words, I make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, a donkey is actually its own special subspecies. It's domestic ass and it has 62 chromosomes versus a horse who has 64. Uh, the term burro is usually used for a wild domestic ass, uh, Mexican or Spanish descent. The American donkeys that we commonly see were originated from North Africa. The Jack is an uncastrated male donkey, and then a Jenny or a Jenna is a female donkey. And then a gelding is a castrated male so that he cannot have babies. So a mule then is the offspring between a female horse, a mare, and a Jack. And what you get when you combine those two is uh, a mule with 63 chromosomes. So like you would anticipate, ass has 62, horse has 64, the middle is 63. A henny is not as common, but it is the um, male stallion for a male horse and then a female donkey. So that's the Jenny and the stallion, and they also have 63 chromosomes. What you'll find in mules and hennies is that most of them are sterile, so they can't reproduce. And so you need the donkey and the horse to be able to make mules. Um, donkeys come in all shapes and sizes and all colors. So you can see just four different colors right here in this picture. You have pink, dark brown, light gray, dark gray. They come in multiple colors like paint and spotted. So that was one misconception that I had when my first load stepped off the trailer. I didn't realize that they were anything other than gray. Like that's all I'd seen donkeys be. So it was really neat to see different colors. You have three distinct sizes, miniature, standard, and then mammoth. So and there's different ranges in between those. You might have a large standard or a small mammoth, but yeah. They actually call them mammoths? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, mammoth. I had two last year, but they were pretty neat. So when they came in America on the second voyage of Christopher Columbus, um, they came because they were really used for breeding mules, which were considered um, an esteemed riding companion for Spanish nobles. So if you wanted a, a mule, you were up there. And they were quote unquote used as, or talked about as the mule possesses the sobriety, patience, endurance, and sure footedness of the donkey and the vigor, strength, and courage of the horse. So that's where they were first brought over here um, from the new, into the new world. And then we have used them throughout history in America as sort of the backbone workers. So they have been used um, in transportation, like building railroads, mining, Someone mentioned logging earlier, so they were used to, to pull. Um, they have a very steadfast, we often see them uh, in the gold rush panhandling, so they were carrying pack animals. And then mules were used uh, a lot in transportation from covered wagons coming over. So it's some of those things that we have 
kind of forgotten about the history. They were the backbone sort of of America and they were the first workers. And so it's kind of, I think important to revisit that history. And then we've also seen them as we're celebrated yesterday, Veterans Day, they were used in World War I and World War II for transportation, supply lines, and then getting in unaccessible areas, bringing in munitions and stuff. So I thought that was neat to recognize the donkey veterans. But here now we have some conditions that are not very favorable for the American donkey. Um, they are considered an invasive species because they are not native from here. And what they are doing is they're outperforming in the desert region, they're outperforming the native species like the bighorn sheep and the antelope. And they are also extremely efficient at energy conversion. So a donkey raised in the desert can take the barest of stuff, shrubs and just brambles and sticks and convert that to high energy. So they don't need that much to live off of. They're also known to dig up to three feet to find water in the desert. So they're very adaptable. Um, and we're seeing that they are now um, overpopulating specific areas in Utah, Nevada, California and Arizona. And so um, 1920 started sort of the alarm bell, the Department of Interior reported to the White House, like, hey, we've got to do something. They are causing problems specifically in the Grand Canyon. Um, they were talked about as destroying the trails that they were using um, and they had, were increasing as a pest they were labeled. They were uh, taking the plateaus and, and stripping them of the forage. And so the wild game were being forced out. And so what that set into motion then was a series of eradication plans in the United States to kind of bring this invasive species problem under control. And that lasted until 1971, where they passed the um, Wild and Free Horse Burrow Act which basically protected and put under the Bureau of Land Management, the ownership and management of these specific areas in regards to wild horses and burrows. And that's been an ongoing issue of trying to maintain the right population, control the population. There's 12,000 wild burrows estimated right now that just roam on Arizona, California, and Nevada. But nationwide, there's an estimated 88,000 wild horses and burros. So that number's combined. They don't break it up into just um, specifically. But the 12,000 burros is sort of the issue that they're trying to deal with now in Arizona, California, and Nevada. And then in California specifically, around the Death Valley and the Mojave Desert, you have seen an increase over the last two years of 76%. So what's happening is your military bases, you're seeing wild burrows kind of take over the shade of like um, their barracks and you're seeing satellites, the shade of satellites being kind of overrun by burrows who are trying to escape the heat. You're seeing towns where burrows just kind of walk the streets looking for food and water and shelter from the sun. And so it's become a, an ongoing problem that the government has been trying to alleviate. Um, what BLM has been doing in the past 10 to 15 years is rounding up large herds of wild burros and horses, usually by helicopter, and it's usually pretty invasive. And then they load them into big panel pens on the desert, kind of like feedlots, dry feedlots. And um, they've been doing some sort of adoption policy programs and recently, the last two years, they've given adopters an incentive. They will pay you $1,000 if you come take a wild burrow. The problem is they're wild and they don't come with any sort of guarantee or training. And so people end up getting these wild burrows and realizing this is not as easy as I thought it was going to be. And then that just continues the problem. Um, last year in 2019, the BLM reported that they removed 7,703 burrows from BLM lands. They were placed into private care. Almost all of them were placed into private care. Um, and out of those, 1,400 were trained from the Borough of Land Management, their training program. But this is to the tune of taxpayers of $85 million that they spent in 2019 
just feeding, capturing, and maintaining these burrows. So in the US, we kind of have some issues with how we're gonna manage the borough population. Worldwide, we have a bigger issue. And so what we're seeing is a huge uptake in the donkey skin trade. And the reason that donkey skins are so valuable is because there's a Chinese traditional medicine called EGO, and it's used for a lot of different purposes. And it's derived only from the donkey carcass, mainly, sorry, mainly from the donkey carcass. So since 1992, China has seen a collapse of their donkey population by 76%. So they've almost wiped out their entire donkey population. And then you're seeing it being affected in other countries as well. So Kenya in 2018, you can see from the stats on the screen there, 160,000 donkeys were slaughtered and if they continue at this rate, they're going to lose their entire donkey population by 2023. Burkina Faso, 45,000 donkeys were slaughtered in just six months between October 2015 and January 2016. And then um, in the US right now, we don't have anything outlying donkey hides. And so what you have seen from 2017 until now is a price change. Donkeys at slaughter hides used to be $4. Now they're up to $50. So you're seeing people who are getting $1,000 from BLM to take a train, to take a donkey, adopt it, and then they are taking it right back into a slaughterhouse and getting an extra $50. And then therefore those donkeys are being sort of recycled into this vicious donkey trade. Um, a lot of the African countries are starting to put into process now legislation that outlaws this donkey trade because donkeys are very integral to the family for working, for transportation. So what's happening is you're seeing a black market now of families losing their donkeys because someone can come steal it and then gather them up, trade them off for their donkey skins and make some profit. So they're, they're having to come up with some, some ways to eliminate this donkey trade. Um, and and I, until they get a handle on it, it's going to continue to rise. There's an estimated 4.8 million donkey hides that are needed each year to satisfy. So if we continue with that, we're going to see the 44 million donkeys that are populating the world right now kind of eradicated. And then on the other side of the world in Australia, what you're seeing is sort of a different problem Donkeys are so well adapting there that they're out competing the sheep. So they're grazing away what they need for their sheep industry. And so they're trying to eradicate donkeys to try and manage the control. And they've been recently um, looked at what's called the Judas method. And so what they're doing is they're taking a Jenny and they are putting a tracker collar on her. They're turning her loose. She's heading out to her herd and then they're coming down with helicopters and just shooting all of the donkeys, wiping out an entire herd except for her, and then letting her go back to find another herd. And so remember at the beginning when I talked about how donkeys are very social and familial. So imagine this, you know, I'm a lone donkey, I'm going to find family or find more companionship. And then that just leads the executioners to their front door. So the Kimberley region, specifically in Australia, kind of put this into place and they had 590,000 donkeys that were killed in this manner just in 2017. So it's going to be interesting to see how they continue to manage their donkey population. Um, it's kind of, kind of depressing. So let's move to something not depressing. <laughs> let's move to how we can fix this. Um, so here's me and here I want to talk about how I got involved in sort of this donkey issue and how we can make lives better. Um, that's my family and I feel like I'm a Mrs. Old McDonald had a farm. I grew up on a farm. We've had everything. My husband and I farm 100 acres in Longview where we try and raise our animals in a sustainable way so that they enjoy a happy life before they go on my dinner plate um, or other people's dinner plates. So one thing I did not have was a donkey. And so in 2017, I was like, hey, I really need a donkey on my place. I've been reading about how they are really good at being a livestock guardian for sheep. 
So I'm interested in seeing if I can put them in the field with my sheep and they can protect them from coyotes and see. And so my husband was like, okay, like any great supporting spouse, he was like, let's do it. So I searched all over, um, Craigslist came through for me as, as it often does. And I found this donkey up in Puyallup. So I rushed up there to get him. And when I stepped off the trailer, it sort of opened my eyes to the plight of what's going on with donkeys in our own area. And, and that is, we often see a huge neglect in their nutrition and in their um, hoof care. So he was grossly overweight. He had been fed straight alfalfa, which is a huge no-no because of their energy conversion. He had massive fat pockets on his neck and his butt. His feet had overgrown. He'd foundered, which is a breakdown of the laminae, which are what holds the coffin bone in the hoof wall. So his coffin bone had started to deteriorate a little bit. So he was pretty lame, um, wild. It took four grown men to kind of corner him and get him into a trailer and my husband looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and I looked at this donkey and I looked into his eyes and I swear he looked into my soul and I was like, I need him. So I brought him home and we, it took me a couple weeks, a couple months to build this trust between him. And then he turned into an amazing donkey, a uh, companion to everybody. He fell in love with the dogs. He liked the sheep, the goats climbed all over his back. If anyone follows me on Facebook, you can often see Poncho and the, the dogs and Poncho and the pigs and Poncho and whoever. So he did well on the farm, but I realized that he was lonely. He just didn't bond as well with the animals. And so I went on a search to find him a companion. And I went back to trusty Craigslist, couldn't find anything, um, went to Facebook. And then what I ended up coming across was peaceful valley donkey rescue so this is when i was first introduced to mark and amy myers and amy myers is kind of my hero um she was in california she wanted a donkey she found a neighborhood donkey it was neglected so then she looked around and saw more neglected donkeys and she just kind of started finding them and bringing them home and at one point they had 250 donkeys on their place that she had rescued and was rehabilitating. And so her husband, Mark kind of said, Hey, we either have a problem or <laughs> we need to find a bigger place and a solution to what's going on. So they ended up moving from California to this giant dairy farm in San Angelo, Texas. And they started what is called peaceful Valley donkey rescue. And it is an amazing organization. It's worldwide and it is the largest equine rescue in the world. And at a glance, just really quick, um, they've been in operation for 20 years and they have rescued 16,000 donkeys. Currently right now there's 2,400 plus in their care. And what they have done is they've created this backbone that stretches through the entire United States. So there's 57 locations that they are rescuing from including the US Caribbean and then now Australia. Um, Peaceful Valley was just nominated last year for the CNN Heroes. So they made the top 10 list for the Heroes Award. So if anyone's interested, Google CNN Heroes. It was really neat to watch their video and, and hear their story. But their big idea was, what if we took the American donkey and we humanely gathered them, we trained them, we transported them, we adopted them out throughout the United States, and we helped educate people. And what if we did all of this as a nonprofit? So this is not costing taxpayers anything and it's helping ease the plight of the American donkey, specifically the American donkey. So Texas is a place where donkeys are have little value. A lot of people just dump donkeys off at the end of the road, especially when we had the drought of 2011 to 2015, people were just dumping their donkeys. They weren't worth anything to them. And so um, Mark and Amy started taking in all these donkeys that they could. So owner surrenders, uh, we cannot take BLM donkeys unless we have a contract with them now. So if a donkey is over 10 years old or he has had a failed adoption, he or she has had a failed adoption three times, then we can buy them at a low cost BLM burrows that have been kept. But what we can do is we can get donkeys from state lands. 
So right now we have what's going on is called the Wild Burrow Project. And we are getting donkeys from the Mojave Desert, some state land in the Mojave Desert, where we set up these big round pens with kind of fingers. And then we put good yummy food and water inside. So a donkey will push the fingers open to get in there and then not be able to come out. Kind of like a crab trap when you're out fishing. Um, so these donkeys come in, they're not rounded up by helicopters. It takes time, but what you have is you have these donkeys who are just kind of connected together and captured together in a very calm way. And then we transport them into horse trailers. We take them to different satellites. So what he, what Mark and Amy have set up then are regional areas in the United States. So they have their main location in Texas. And then they have a West regional site, which is in scenic Arizona. And that's a facility where we can train donkeys. They have a hired person that trains, uh, they have a manager. And then that West satellite feeds everybody who's an adoption area on the West coast. So they have training centers, they have adoption centers, they have gentling centers. So maybe someone like Courtney says, you know, I don't really know how to train donkeys, but I have an extra acre and I would love to have a couple donkeys hanging out. And we have wild donkeys that need to be gentled down that just need to kind of understand that humans are nice. So there's ways to kind of match people. I'm in my office, my phone just rang. There's kind of ways to match people with sort of how they want to help. Um, and it's a really neat system. So what we're seeing then is we capture these wild donkeys We've also been asked to take over a couple hoarding cases. There was a major hoarding case in Olancha, California, over 200 donkeys were in some pretty just disgusting conditions. And so we were brought in by the government to kind of figure out how we can take care of these donkeys. And so once they you know, help bring them in, vet checks, then we put them into a training program and then once they're trained, they're sent out to people like me who are satellite adoption areas. So imagine this big sort of map of the United States and you have different regions and you have different training areas in those regions. You have different transportation areas in those regions. And then you're filtering out all these donkeys to different adoption areas. So in Washington state, we have two adoption sites, one in Riverside, which is up north by the Canadian border, east of Washington, east Washington, and then you have me in Castle Rock. And within that, you have people who are looking for donkeys. They either, like me, look through Cra Craigslist and can't find them, or they're on Facebook, or they just want them, and so they find, you know, the internet takes them to Peaceful Valley. They submit an application. So what I do is I end up getting applications for people who are near me, and then I contact them and say, hey, I'll get a shipment in spring. And what happens is um, 20 trained donkeys will step off the trailer at my house. It's pretty awesome to see. So they bring the donkeys to me, they step off the trailer, they're already trained. And by trained, I mean, they accept a halter, they're friendly, they pick up all four feet and they lead. Now leading might be a misconception. They will go when they want to go with you. <laughs> they don't often go whenever you ask them to. Um, so they come to me, I find the perfect family for them. I kind of match people what they need. And then um, we find a way to get donkeys to the families. So here's a picture of a really neat family in Castle Rock who these two kids will have the best companions for the rest of their life in Ellie and Bella. And so it's really neat to see the matching of families with donkeys. So this is a really neat organization to be a part of because no matter how you want to be involved there's kind of a, a way for you and I feel like it's doing a really good job of figuring out how we have this problem so in addition to the well borough project we also have um, research going on with the University of California in Davis and then um, also some veterinary hospitals in Texas and so what we're trying to do is figure out genetically what is the best way to help to keep wild burrows, but to help manage them so that they're not overpopulating the United States. And so that's an ongoing project. They've put on trackers. Uh, I can't remember the number of how many donkeys they put trackers on, but basically it's just to gather information. How far do they go? What's their range? Who's with them? 
we can kind of see their movements. Do they spend different times in different areas? And so we can gather that data and figure out what is the best way to move forward so we can manage the, the wild burrow and keep it where it should be in the United States. So that's some, some big ideas that are happening now. Awesome. Um, so this leads me to why people adopt. And there's, there's some different reasons. Katie's getting, she's like, I'm up, batter's up. Uh, so uh, hang on, Katie, just a second. So uh, some of the reasons that people adopt, one of them is land management. Donkeys love blackberry bushes. They love brush. They're kind of like a giant goat, but they're better because they don't want to get out and they don't want to eat your car. So People who have a couple acres want something that can come manage the brush. They want to eat some of the grass down, but they don't necessarily want a cow or a horse. Um, and donkeys are kind of like big, nice, gentle dogs. So that's one reason that people adopt. Another reason people adopt is companionship. And donkeys have this very calm demeanor. They're what we term as energy absorbers. So they take the energy from around them and like bring it in and kind of hold it. So when you have chaos happen, the donkey will look around and evaluate and then make a decision. He won't just freak out or she won't just freak out and react. Like I have a lot of horses that they would run over me to get out of the barn. So that's kind of a really neat thing. Um, race horses, barrel racers, people that have lonely horses often want donkeys as companions to kind of help them find their zen. And then the latest that's been happening, which is really neat, and I'm gonna let Katie talk about this, is that there's been a lot of studies that are coming out with donkeys and their help with PTSD and autism. So I'm gonna turn it over to Katie because she's gonna talk about her amazing daughter here, Keely and Pancake. So Katie, it's yours. So I've had cattle since I was 12. Um, it's how I found my confidence, something that I could thrive at. And so after I graduated high school, you know, I was doing college and, you know, being an adult and all of that. And I, I stopped with the cows, but I told my husband when he just met me, we're early on in dating. I'm like, if, if you take me, you take the future cows that I'm bringing to our relationship. He's like, okay, whatever. Um, and I wanted the, the farm family lifestyle that I grew up with because I, I feel there's a lot of independence and benefits to living on a farm. So we have our two kids and my daughter got diagnosed with autism at the age of four. Now I'd already had her start showing like a little calf and just trying to get her out and, and have some self-expression. She, she's a little late in speaking and that's usually one of the warning, you know, one of the symptoms of, of autism. And so I thought, you know, she didn't really relate to people. She's like, she could take it or leave it if, if a person was around. Her, her joy is being in her own little head and her own world. And Michael Ann, when she got started with the donkey stuff, was telling me about the, the connection donkeys have with people who have autism. And I started looking at videos that she recommended and just realizing what careful caretakers they are for special individuals and I thought oh okay we'll we'll try one of these all right we'll we'll give it a shot and so Michael Ann got her first load of donkeys in and said all right you're, you're my guinea pig you come over check the donkeys out see see what fits and so I you know packed up the kids and we headed over and I don't know if they were more excited for the s'mores that we had or the donkeys I don't know um but we're in a field and the donkeys are just walking around on their own no halters or control and my daughter's standing along the fence and one of the donkeys just gently slowly calmly comes over and starts sniffing her and she's like starts to squeal and is, gets excited and the donkey just stayed so mellow he, there was just this curiosity to him and then uh so that one ended up being tug and he was a miniature so i'm like i like miniatures and then there was this other little donkey and he has this wonky little ear and he was just an old soul to start with. And so she had walked over to him 
she put her arm over his back and they just started walking together towards there was something over it at the gate he wanted to see and so she's walking with her arm over his back and then there's a string of donkeys following them and it was she was like the donkey whisperer it was it was precious and she had a connection to these animals in a way that she didn't seek out with adults, especially kids. Like she really had no interest in kids. And so I went from saying, oh, we'll get one to, oh, we're taking both the minis. Thank you very much. And we, um, Michael Ann ended up reaching out to KGW to tell him about this. And so we got to make it a whole family affair. This was uh, one of the pictures that we took on our actual adoption day and brought them back to our house. So my daughter was also involved with occupational therapy at a place in Longview called Kids Space that helps deal with uh, people who just have kids who have challenges and and struggle in the world and just need they need and their parents need to learn tools to help them cope. And I realized our daughter is very fortunate because we have a 10 acre farm where she can just come and go as she pleases. It, it's safe. She, when she just needs space, she go hops on, she goes and hops on her bike and runs around or goes just talking to herself, you know, out in the backyard. And uh, we just, it's a very kid friendly space. And a lot of kids don't have the opportunity to have animals, a safe space to just be kids in their own unique way without judgment. And so I would do these uh, kids space activity days. It had you know, Halloween costumes, you know, Santa at Christmas. And then I wanted to provide kids with an opportunity to get to interact with animals because um, I find especially the minis in my personal experience are really sensitive and aware of being around unique people, unique kids and, and knowing to be calm when they need to be calm. And so I had the kids come over and they walked pancake up and down the field, uh, the driveway. They were just, you know, and the parents are glowing as they're seeing their kids' excitement because, I mean, maybe they can't even have a house or a, a dog or a cat based on, you know, the rent restrictions or whatnot. But now they're getting to play with, with a donkey and take it for a walk and, them just being so proud and looking at their parents saying, oh my gosh, look at me, I'm doing so good. And um, just knowing that there's, it's a safe animal. And while I love my cows, I also don't trust them <laughs> with my kids, 100%. Like the, the little ones who've been with my kids the whole time, that's fine. But the mamas who are like, you are a small little thing in my field and you don't belong here. And even my cows that I've had for, you know, eight years, I saw her put her head down and start to stomp towards my daughter. And thankfully I screamed at her and she, you know, the, the cow, I screamed at the cow and the cow turned away and knew it was bad. But my daughter can just go out into the field and sit. She'll sit on a tree that fell over and just hang out with the donkeys. And I don't have to have any fear. She trusts them. I trust them and just trying to then be an advocate then for how amazing these creatures are like and I'm a diehard cow fan and I would get rid of other than one I would get rid of every one of my cows to have more donkeys just because <laughs> there's so much more to them than I thought I had the the image in my mind the stereotype of stubborn and yes they can be stubborn but that's just because they know their own mind and they're like you're not going to convince me otherwise. So I'm, I'm a little jealous that Poncho would hang out with everybody. My, my donkeys hate, hate my cows, hate them, hate them. Cows love them. So they'll go check out the donkeys and the donkeys are booking it. Like get away from me. Um, but it's, so I even, uh, last November, I have a friend who owns the bookstore in Castle Rock and she did a pajama fundraiser. And she wanted there to be a draw for kids to get to enjoy. And so they read The Wonky Donkey. And I brought my two donkeys and my, my cow that I know I can trust with anybody. And I literally tied them to fence posts in the middle of Castle Rock. 
and, or uh, lampposts. And they get just got swarmed and, and Tug, I normally wouldn't bring Tug, he's not quite a socialist pancake, but he's my codependent donkey who doesn't go anywhere uh, or pancake, he has to be where pancake is. Otherwise he just gets so sad. And that's one of the things about the companionship. Donkeys are so sensitive because they attach so strongly. They are so committed to, to those that they care for. Um, and so Tug gets to join in the mix, but again, they, they're aware of the little kids. And even though if an adult tried to come near him, he'd be a little more antsy, but those kids, they just swarmed him and they all just stood there and they took the loving and the kids loved it. They got, you know, you get to answer questions about them and give them this opportunity that, you know, that most people don't have. So I am, I'm a diehard donkey fan now. And while I can't make the economic contributions I have a truck and I have a big trailer and I like to drive it. So I, I told Michael Ann, I can't take more donkeys, but I can help you take the donkeys to their new home. And like her and I are road tripping it to the San Juan Islands on Saturday morning, uh, just so that we can find a donkey who's, who's had it hard, a, a good loving home. Oh. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Uh, there's been some recent studies with donkeys and dementia patients. So it'd be interesting to see as I follow that, how that's going to turn out and some, some awesome opportunities for donkeys in that area. Oh, went too far. Hang on. So um, how you can help educate yourself and those around you. So change the narrative. If people are like, oh, it's just a donkey. They're just stubborn. You know, maybe you say, well, I heard they're more like self-preserving or they're very loyal. If you can adopt, do it. You'll ne you will not regret it. So if you have an extra couple acres, Nolan, how much acres do you have there in Castle Rock? I think you could use a couple donkeys. If you can volunteer, if you can give, Peaceful Valley has some pretty cool swag. You can go on their website at donkeyrescue.org and read about their mission. You can adopt a special needs donkey. There are some donkeys that will just live their life out at the San Angelo, Texas place because they've had rough experience and some health issues. And so we just make them comfortable and let them live their life out. Uh, the biggest thing you can do is follow me on Facebook, Peaceful Valley Donkey Rescue, Castle Rock, Washington. I promise you, you will not regret it. So whenever I get donkeys in for adoption, I make them all their personal bios. Um, they have professions. My last donkey was a welder. So Mary was a welder kind of helping promote women in professional trades. We've had a couple scholars come through. Um, I haven't had an accountant yet, so I'm saving that. Nolan, that special one's gonna be for you in, in charge of human resources and stuff. But um, yeah, so follow me, share posts because there, you might find someone somewhere down the road that would look for a donkey and need one. And so we can find them a forever home. And then do some Google. So Google CNN Heroes Mark Myers. It's a really neat video. If it doesn't bring a tear to your eye, you might be a little dead inside. Like it's a really touching video. And then check out the Peaceful Valley Donkey Rescue. Uh, check out their website. It's it's kind of neat just to kind of see what they're doing and their mission. But um, yeah, so I'm going to leave you for some questions now. And I'm going to leave you with just some pictures of my recent adoptions and sort of the love that's been passed around and the love that will continue to get passed around. So I think I covered all that I could in this short time. There's so much more, but if you have any questions, I'm willing to try my best to answer them. Actually, I have a couple. I'm gonna start us off before we uh, start seeing them coming in here. Um, so I'm a city girl, uh, did not grow up on land or anything like that. So I have a couple just basics here. What is the lifespan of a donkey? Good question. Uh, it can live up to 55 years. Wow. Yeah. In the wild, it's about 30, anywhere from 25 to 30, but in captivity, they can go up to 50. Yeah. Okay. And then also how big is a mammoth donkey? So a standard donkey is about the size of 500 pounds and the wither. So it's, it's uh, right where the neck connects to the backbone will come to about my chest. So the mammoth donkey is anything over that. And I would have to look up the actual dimensions to be able to tell you everything's in hands. So to try and explain hands, but the mammoth donkey that I had, his backbone was above my head and I'm five foot six. So they are giant, gentle giants. His head was bigger than my entire torso. So it was pretty neat. 
Okay, we're getting some questions rolling in here. So um, firstly, uh, we have somebody asking if we can get it, if they can get a copy of the slides. Um, and I will say that if you, uh, um, we, we can see if maybe we can post them on the website. So if Michael Ann, you would send these to me, I can, no problem. I can see what we can do about that. Um, then also Melanie asks, do they need their hooves trimmed every six to eight weeks like horses? It depends on the donkey and depends on the environment. So when they're out in the wild and they're on sand, they're like self filing their feet all the time. So when we get them from the wild, no matter what their age, they hardly ever have hoof conditions. Now here in the Pacific Northwest, we see more hoof conditions because it's wetter and we don't have that natural sand. So if you have like, um, any kind of rock around places they often visit. So like rock around the watering tank or rock or like to get to the barn, they'll actually self chip and kind of file. But I have my personal donkeys on an eight week rotation for hoof trimming. And it's a quick little five minute job because it's just a file down, but yes. And that is one thing that is neglected in donkeys in this area is hoof care because people don't work with them enough. And when you're a prey animal, you want all four feet on the ground at all times. Um, and so it's, if you don't have the trust of your donkey, it's hard to get them to pick up their feet very well if they've never been worked with. So that's my goal is to make sure that when donkeys leave my area, they do have good hoof manners so that they can get their feet taken care of. But yeah, great question. Okay. Uh, some more we have, uh, do they eat hay grass like horses and do they get shots like horses? Yes. So the, what, Okay, so there's a little misconception about donkeys and food. So people hear donkeys should eat straw, donkeys should eat straw. And that's true if it's barley straw, but we don't have barley straw. It's not grown here in this area. So what we have when we call straw is like that coarse bedding stuff. And there's no nutritional value in that. So a local grass hay is really good. Um, people feed Timothy. So anything that has a low protein, other, other under 16% is, is good for donkeys. Um, and some people free choice. Some people feed like they do a horse, a couple uh, flakes in the morning and a couple flakes at night. I tend to have mine in a big slow feeder so they can eat all day long when they want to nibble and then they're not consuming too much. And then as far as vaccines, they have a, a really good immune system, but we recommend the same thing that you would every year for your horse, an influenza vaccine that also takes care of tetanus, especially in the Pacific Northwest, tetanus is an issue. Okay. Um, how does it, how can a person volunteer and what is the website? Yeah. So the website is uh, donkeyrescue.org. And then as follows, as far as volunteering, it's depending on what you want to do. So I have people that come to my place, especially since COVID happened and people are kind of wanting something to do. Um, people come regularly and they, uh, the main thing I need is just brushing. Like I just want the donkeys to be handled every day. So right now I have six at my house that are waiting for adoptions. And that's just because I went to Tillamook and we have a training facility there on Tuesday and I picked up four. So I have two that are going to the San Juan Islands on Saturday with Katie, going to be their forever home, an island donkey, imagine that. And then I have four that I just picked up. And so my job then is to brush them, work their feet, make sure that I can halter them, just have them be around people. So for volunteers, I love that when they come to my place and just wanna hang out with donkeys, that's the best. And then if you want to, you know, clean or build fence, no problem. I can hook you up too. Um, if you want to spend some really nice time, you can go down to the training facility in Arizona. If you're looking for a vacation and you can love on baby donkeys all day long and do the same thing, love and pet and brush and pick feet and lead and however you want to. Yeah. Okay. Can they be, oh, Michael wants to know, can they be house trained? <laughs> Yes. If anyone follows Arnold Schwarzenegger on Facebook, he has a mini donkey, Lulu, and Lulu lives in his house and Lulu is amazing. So yes, donkeys are very easy to house train. I have not tried it myself, but I know that because they tend to poop in the same place altogether, communal pooping spot in the stall, in the horse barn and communal pooping spot in the field. So it's one pile to pick up regardless of how many donkeys you have. They also have one lay down spot too. So you'll have one bare spot in the middle of your field where they all decide this is the favorite spot to roll. Uh, can they be trained to be ridden, not with saddle, but bareback? Yes, both with saddle and with bareback. Oh. So the, the recommended is 30%. They can take up to 30% of their weight. So obviously the bigger donkeys, the more weight they can handle. 
Um, and not everything goes by that, but that's just the new recommended 30%. But yeah, we see there are some donkeys that have actually been reigning champions and there's donkeys that do trail riding. There's donkeys that do dressage. Dressage is sort of like the ballerina dancing for horses. Um, it's not as fluid as a horse, but it's still pretty neat to watch. Well, I have learned so much today. <laughs> um, this is fantastic. Uh, it looks like we uh, have gone through all the questions that are in the chat and the Q and A. Um, so I want to give you a chance to, if there's anything else you'd like to say or any thoughts to lead us, leave us with. Adopt a donkey. <laughs> I would say, so once we're able to go back to having outings and having group gatherings, uh, I do know that there will be, Jennifer with the vault in Castle Rock wants to have more pancake and tug and Moana, she's the cow events. So if you did Facebook like um, Michael Ann's Peaceful Valley donkey thing, you'd be able to see whenever pancake and tug make an outing and you can come and visit them. Uh, I just, I really, I really miss being able to do that. And they're just, they're fun, fun creatures to be around. So yeah. Oh, we do have one more question coming in. Melanie wants to know what a slow feeder looks like. Oh, so a slow feeder, it can look different ways. Um, I have it as my husband built me a box, like a wooden box that is the size of a hay bale. So I put the hay bale in there and then I have a metal grate that goes over top of it. So think about like cattle panels have these thick metal grates. So it's kind of like a four by four square. So the donkey has to reach through the four by four square and pull the hay out. So what that does is it at least it lets them kind of one, it's a game. They have to like reach through and, and find their little hay pieces out, but it kind of makes it so they can't just stick their head in there and toss hay out to find the best stuff. Um, and it originated from my horse because my horse is a, a, a huge hay waster. And so I came across a slow feeder idea on the internet and then my husband built them for me. Some people use hay nets that they hang up really high and there's really small holes um, the smaller, the better the donkey has to pick through because they're actually really nimble with their forefront of their lip. So it's really neat to see them kind of maneuver and they're really gentle with their teeth and what they want to bite. So that's a slow feeder. Great. Um, that hay, bale of hay, how long does it take them to get through one of those? Uh, depends on the donkey. So I will put, okay, I've got nine donkeys at my house right now and I will feed two bales a day and I still have some left over but I have field and pasture too so um I want to say that the recommended is I, I'm not even going to ask just google it google how much hay should my donkey get I want to say it's like 10 pounds per donkey per day but that also depends on forage type age size all that kind of stuff um, they do eat considerably less than a horse and they do not do the damage on my fields. I had 18 donkeys on one acre all winter long and I still had green grass. So if anyone is a horse person, you would realize that one horse on one acre all winter long, it would be bare dirt. All right, well, thank you so much. No oh. water. It's crazy how little water they drink. I, my cows will go through a tank and in two days and the donkeys it doesn't look like they've even touched it so they're very easy keepers as far as that it's kind of a set it and forget it they got water <laughs> is, is that related to their efficiency um part of that yeah. sort of their, their biology is much more efficient with their resources yeah they can go a lot longer without water too okay all right, well, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and uh i i gotta say i i kind of want to pay a visit and, and birth some donkeys now. So I'll have to, uh, I'll have to get in touch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you to our audience for coming and we hope to see you next week. Thanks, Take care. Everyone. Everybody.